The MIT Alternative News Collective sponsors this and other progressive events on MIT's campus and produces The Thistle, a newspaper wherein the progressive and creative minds of MIT and the surrounding community can share their work. Born in the midst of the campus protest against apartheid in South Africa in 1987, The Thistle has co consistently explored unjustified decision making in many aspects of MIT affairs over the past seven years. As a collective, members are able to participate al and alternately coordinate every aspect of newspaper production. We hope and have many reasons to believe that the actions and presence of the Thistle on the campus has helped improve the experience of students, staff, and faculty of the Institute, and hopefully has inspired people to continue to support progressive causes. However, to continue these contributions, the collective needs your support. The donation that was asked at the door is not only going to help provide events like tonight's talk, but will also help purchase supplies to produce the paper. More importantly, we encourage all interested people to join with us by attending a collective meeting. We meet every Wednesday evening in the MIT Student Center. If you're interested, please sign up on the sheet that was at the front door and will be passed around during the talk. We hope to see you at next week's meeting. Tonight, the MIT Alternative News Collective is proud to present Professors Israel Shahak and Noam Chomsky two of the world's foremost analysts of Middle Eastern issues. There will be time at the end of the speeches for members of the audience to ask questions and make very brief statements. Therefore, we ask that everyone please respect each other's desire to hear the speeches in their entirety. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Noam Chomsky, who will introduce Professor Shahak. Well, my instructions about 15 minutes ago were to say a few things about the Middle East and then to uh, uh, make a few words of introduction to uh, Israel Shachak, an old, fr an old friend. I realized on the way over that uh, my files are full of fascinating uh, and highly informative correspondence with him over many years, I guess about 25 years now. Uh, but I've never heard him give a talk, I don't think. And I'd like to remedy that tonight uh, and would prefer to listen rather than to give a talk myself and urge you to as well. But uh, since I'm obedient and follow instructions, uh, I will uh, spend a few moments uh, commenting. Uh, however, not about the announced title on which I have absolutely nothing to say except what I've learned from him and you can hear it from him. Uh, but on another topic uh, uh, that I know something about and that also has a special importance for me and I think it should for most of you, uh, and that is the U.S. role in the Middle East. The special importance is obvious. First of all, that's our responsibility uh, and that means that we can do something about it. It's within our power to change. Uh, and secondly, the responsibility happens to be huge. I mean, it's huge in most of the world, but in this case, it's just overwhelming. Uh, the U.S. has an overwhelmingly uh, influential role in the affairs of the region. Uh, it, the, in the la last few years, the United States has, in effect, succeeded in a long-standing objective of pretty much extending the Monroe Doctrine uh, over the uh, Middle East. The Gulf War, in my opinion, was basically intended, from the U.S. point of view, to teach the world that lesson, get everybody else to back off and to recognize, as George Bush put it elegantly in the middle of the war, uh, that what we say goes. Uh, that's the lesson of the New World Order, he said. Uh, and that lesson is particularly uh, to be applied in the Middle East region, which way back um, 50 years ago, the State Department described as uh, the, uh, 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 a stupendous source of strategic power and the greatest material prize in world history the, great, one of the greatest uh, prize in the world in the field of foreign investment and one that the U.S. was certainly going to take over, not because of the enormous, only because of the enormous wealth and profits from oil production and so on, but because holding that region is a lever for world control. Uh, and that was well understood and it's fully explicit in the internal record. And it influences, of course, determinatively influences the, the uh, policy record. Uh, just in passing, I should say that in the older areas of the uh, Monroe Doctrine, the question of other people getting in our way isn't an issue. Uh, so take, say, Cuba. Uh, the United States is now in the, what they hope, what planners hope is the final stage of uh, 
uh, crushing Cuba, of getting them to uh, say uncle, to borrow the words of George Shultz when he was referring to the Palestinians, talking to his boss a few years ago. Uh, he complained that the Palestinians were saying unk, 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 and oh, 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 but they never really came right out and uh, said uncle. And uh, for a real first-rate thug, you've got to make sure that your victims uh, you know, own up properly and do what you tell them. You know, they've got to grovel properly or else you, they're, you know, that the, the world doesn't learn the lessons about what we say goes. Uh, Cuba's got to learn those lessons too and they have to suffer particularly because they've been standing up and trying to follow a course of independence for 30 years. Uh, just a few weeks ago there was a vote in the United Nations, uh, uh, 101 to 2, uh, condemning the latest phases of the U.S. Uh, embargo in Cuba, specifically designed by the Clinton administration to block food and medicines, about 90 percent of what's blocked is indeed food and medicines, to make sure that plenty of children starve to death and so on. Uh, the, t the vote was, as I said, was 101 to 2. Uh, the two were the United States and Israel. Uh, that's changed from the year before when the United States also managed to pick up Romania. Uh, now only Israel's left. Uh, and that has to do with the Middle East, in fact. One of the minor services that Israel is supposed to provide, this is only one of the minor ones, uh, is to uh, um, sort of make sure that they vote with the boss when uh, it's necessary and to uh, support any outrage that uh, the boss commits. Uh, and for that, they get a huge subsidy. I mean, it's no comparison in world affairs. Uh, and that maintains a, a wealthy but largely artificial society, very rich but on a foreign dole, uh, which you and I pay for. Uh, and that dole is in fact, as well, Human Rights Watch, the leading international human rights monitor a couple of, mo uh, couple of months ago published a book, another book, in which they pointed out once again that U.S. aid to Israel is flatly illegal. It's in flat violation of U.S. law. Uh, because U.S. law quite explicitly forbids any aid, military or other aid, to countries which systematically torture and abuse their citizens. Uh, and this book of Human Rights Watch was just yet another extensive documentation of the fact that that's exactly what we pay for. Uh, however, we should point out that this is no big problem by the standards of international lawlessness in which the U.S. is certainly a major player and, in fact, well in the lead, I think. Uh, this is uh, pretty small potatoes. Uh, well, a few remarks about the U.S. and the Middle East. Uh, I won't talk about what's actually going on now. I think if you think about the background, it all sort of follows. It, you can almost deduce what's happening. Uh, the United States has a general strategic conception as to how to run the uh, strategically most important area in the world and the greatest material prize in world history. It's one that the U.S. pretty much picked up from the British, who used to run the place before we kicked them out. Uh, the, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, there should be several layers of control. First of all, there have to, the, what, the big thing is oil, of course. Uh, so there has to be what the British in the old days called an Arab facade, uh, meaning local managers who do our work for them and who we pretend are independent because that's a way to sort of keep down you know, nationalist feelings and so on and so forth, but they're just an Arab facade. Uh, and as the British put it in secret records, now declassified, this back in the First World War, uh, the British will continue to run the place uh, behind various uh, uh, sort of uh, constitutional fictions, they said, like buffer state and other things. But that's the Arab facade. They have to be weak uh, because we have to make sure that they'll do exactly what we say or else we toss them out. So there has to be a, an array of local managers. That's essentially what the Gulf dictatorships are. They are local managers who jo whose job is to make sure that the huge profits from oil flow to the West, not to the people of the region. That's crucially the case. Uh, British understood it. It's even more important in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, now, the people of the region happen to be backwards and unenlightened. You've all know, known about that. And they somehow don't understand why the wealth of their region has to flow to Westerners, not to them. And since they can't seem to get this through their heads, no matter how much we try to explain it to them, uh, they have to, the Arab facade has to be protected against the local, from the local population. And for that, you need what the Nixon administration called local cops on the beat, uh, uh, local military forces who will kick them in the face if they get the wrong ideas and if, they're, if the local security forces can't handle it. 
So the second layer of control has been uh, an array of gendarmes, uh, Turkey, uh, Iran under the Shah, uh, Pakistan's played that role uh, uh, for a time, uh, and Israel's right in the center of it, you know, especially since 1960s, Israel's been one of the core uh, elements of the uh, gendarmerie. Incidentally, that was recognized by the Joint Chiefs of Staff as far back as 1948. US, they were very impressed by Israel's military victories in that war and concluded, again in secret documents, now declassified that uh, Israel could serve, they said a second, it was second only to Turkey, they felt at the time, as a military base which could be used to project military power particularly important now that the British were withdrawing from the region and the U.S. was moving in and needed its own local cops on the beat. Well, that's Israel's role. Uh, now, the, uh, then in the background, of course, is the United States and its British client, uh, who that's the muscle that you bring in in case things really go wrong. Uh, so that's the strategic conception. Uh, the uh, uh, people, the rights that various participants have depends on their role within this framework. So uh, the local Arab facade, the, these brutal dictatorships that run the, most of the oil states, they have rights as long as they do their job. I mean, if they ever try to get out of line, they'll be gone very quickly. It won't take long. But as long as they perform their, you know, certain, do their job the way they're supposed to, uh, then they have rights. Uh, as for the local cops on the beat, uh, same story. They have rights as long as they continue to do their jobs. They get out of line, it's the end of their rights. Uh, the uh, United States, of course, has rights by definition, so we don't have to ask about that. Uh, and, the, and Britain, too, as long as you know, it's our lieutenant in the region. Well, uh, you consider Israel and Palestine, uh, the two contestants in the former Palestine, Israel and the Palestinians, Israel definitely has rights. Uh, first of all, because of its local services, and also because it performs many other services of which that vote in the UN is just a symbolic illustration, symbolic of much more significant things, like for example, when the Carter uh, administration, uh, the Human Rights Administration was uh, prevented by congressional legislation from sending military aid to its favorite mass murderers in Guatemala. Uh, uh, in fact, it did send the aid anyway, as later turned out, but couldn't send enough and participate actively enough in the mass murders that were going on there, it was possible to call on Israel to do the job for us. And that's happened all over the world. And that's a major service, quite apart from the regional ones. Incidentally, all of these will continue. They have absolutely nothing to do with the Cold War, and they will continue irrespective of the Cold War. That's propaganda. Uh, so that's uh, Israel's rights, a lot of rights, because uh, uh, they do a lot of things, and that's essentially what the huge subsidy is about. Well, what about the Palestinians? Uh, you have to ask, what service do they perform to U.S. power? Uh, and the answer is none. Uh, therefore, they have no rights. That follows just logically. Anybody who doesn't, who understands the least thing about world affairs recognizes that if you don't perform any services to the powerful, your human rights are zero. In fact, in the case of the Palestinians, it's worse. Their rights are actually negative uh, because they perform a disservice. Uh, their displacement and their problems and so on cause the disruption in the region and other people get upset. Not the leadership, like the Saudi Arabian elite couldn't care less, but the local populations do and it makes them harder to control and so on. So the Palestinians, in fact, have negative rights. Uh, and again, that follows just by the normal calculus of world affairs. When you penetrate beyond the stuff you taught in school and so on and you look what actually happens in the world, this is all sort of elementary. Uh, well, from these facts, you can pretty much deduce, close to deduce, uh, policy and uh, the course of events, given you know, who has the determinative role, and you can in particular uh, deduce pretty closely the diplomatic record, which is quite straightforward. Uh, for the last 20 years at least, actually more, uh, the diplomatic record has been pretty much like the lineup at the UN on the Cuba vote, uh, US and Israel versus the world. Uh, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, there are two issues that have been crucial. Both of them related to UN 242, the main, you know, the main Security Council resolution having to do with the region, which is ambiguous in various respects. Uh, and uh, two issues have arisen. One is the issue of withdrawal to the international borders. Uh, on that issue, the United States and Israel stand alone in opposing withdrawal. 
of, I mean, there are a few marginal exceptions, but you know, in anybody who amounts to anything in policy formation, it's the U.S. and Israel versus the world on that one, and has been for since 1971, in fact. Before that, it was Israel alone. Uh, and the second issue is rejectionism. Uh, the U.S. leads the rejectionist camp. And now, here I'm using the term rejectionism in an unconventional, non-racist sense. The standard, the, the West is so racist that the standard usage is fully re racist and nobody even notices it. Uh, rejectionism in the non-racist sense means rejection of the uh, claim to national rights of either of the two contenders for national rights in the former Palestine, uh, Israeli Jews and the indigenous population. But in the West, rejectionism simply means rejection of the rights of, of uh, Israeli Jews. Rejection of the rights of Palestinians is not called rejectionism. Uh, it may be wrong to call that just straight race. Uh, furthermore, nobody notices it, I should say. It's the fact that no one notices it that it's a racism. The policy itself is understandable. If we were to use race rejectionism in a non-racist sense, we would have to conclude that the U.S. is the leader of the rejectionist camp, and that doesn't look nice in New York Times headlines. So therefore, uh, but that's the issue. Uh, the issue is rejectionism, and on that, again, it's essentially the U.S. and Israel against the world. Well, because of this, the U.S. has had to block every diplomatic initiative over the last several decades, uh, fundamentally for these reasons. Uh, if you look, the U.S. has had to veto Security Council resolutions. It's voted with votes like 150 to 2 and so on, usual 2. Uh, on, in the General Assembly, it's blocked other independent initiatives, and essentially there's been no diplomacy. Uh, well, uh, that, uh, uh, incidentally, all of this has to be suppressed. Uh, and it is very efficiently suppressed in the United States. You just even try to find the basic facts. You know, you're going to have to go way out of the mainstream. Uh, suppression of crucial elementary facts is easy in a highly conformist intellectual culture, and that's what ours is, as really deep totalitarian strains. So you can throw history, you can murder history as much as you like, and nothing happens. This is one of the extreme cases, but the record is very clear. Uh, the uh, current peace process, what's now called the peace process, if you look at it, the timing is quite significant. It began in Madrid in the fall of 1991, right after the Gulf War, that is, right after we had made it extremely clear to Europe and the Third World and everybody else that what we say goes, so get out of here and we're going to run it ourselves. Uh, and they understood. Uh, and that led to what is called, to a genuine peace process. That is one that the press and respectable commentators and so on can call a peace process, as they do, because it's unilaterally run by the United States with no one else interfering. And therefore, the United States is able unilaterally to ram through its two crucial objectives. One, no withdrawal to the international borders. And two, no rights whatsoever for the Palestinians. And that's what we're watching unfold. Uh, just follow the story day by day and you see it happening. Of course, you have to decode, but you know, you had to decode if you were living in Russia under Stalin too. You couldn't just take what appeared in Pravda and assume it was literal. You had to know how to read it. And the same is true here. Uh, just a couple of months ago, there was an interesting article in Haaretz, the leading sort of major US journal, uh, by somebody who a lot of you know, Tanya Reinhardt. Hmm? Pardon? Israeli journal. What'd I say? Uh, well, Israeli journal. It's sort of, I, I sometimes call it the Israeli New York Times, but that's too <laughs> insulting to Haaretz, so I don't like to uh, call it that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, this was one of many articles that Israel translated and distributed in one of his many services to uh, all of us. Uh, this, uh, Tanya is a, actually an old personal friend, but also a lot of you know her. She taught here. She was just, got her PhD here. Um, actually, some of her students are here. Uh, she had an article in Haaretz in which she uh, described quite accurately what's happening. She said it's a mistake to compare. There's a lot of talk in, uh, about how what's going on in, in, in Israel and the occupied territories is like the end of apartheid, you know, Mandela, all that kind of stuff. And she said that's completely wrong. It's like the onset of apartheid. Uh, it's like what was going on in South Africa in the 1950s when the vicious apartheid system was established. Uh, in fact, what she said is what is being created is things kind of like Bantu stands, uh, which will, of course, be recognized, just as South African racists and some of their friends abroad rec recognize the Bantu, including Israel, I should say, recognize the Bantu stands there. Uh, but in fact, what is being established is very reminiscent, very similar in many respects to South African apartheid, 
with the Bantu stands, and I think she's quite accurate about that. Uh, just in the last year, ever since the uh, Oslo Agreements, Declaration of Principles, uh, there has been a, about a 10 percent increase in uh, Israeli control of land in the occupied territories. It's up to about three quarters now. Uh, the uh, increase in settlement is approximately the same. You're paying for it and I'm paying for it. All of this is funded by the U.S. taxpayer, couldn't happen otherwise, which means they have to be kept in ignorance of what they're doing because very few people would like it if they knew what they were doing, and indeed they are kept in ignorance. Uh, that's what people go to colleges like MIT for, to learn how to internalize the kind of values that will make them play the role that's required in suppressing the crucial facts about the world from the uh, you know, mass of the population who have to remain in ignorance. So if we do our job, you know, we faculty members, you'll be able to do this kind of stuff. Uh, the, uh, there's a more general point, and that is that the United States and Israel, too, would like very much to formalize. There have always been kind of tacit relationships between the various sectors of control, like the you know, Saudi Arabian dictatorship and the gendarmes, Israel, and so on. Uh, and the, these relationships existed even when they were formally at war for each other, with each other. So there was a period when Saudi Arabia was formally at war with Iran and Israel, uh, but it was actually very close to both of them. And of course, they had the same interest, you know, controlling the population. And uh, the leadership would like to raise those relations to a more formal overt level so they can function more effectively. That's what the conference was about in Morocco the last couple of days, which has been all over the newspapers. Uh, the, uh, a uh, long-term goal would be to turn the region into something that's profitable. Much more, it's already extremely profitable for enrichment, but there's always more. Uh, and you want more enrichment. Uh, so you want people, just a couple of, at the Morocco conference uh, in, in the New York Times, they quoted Adnan Khashoggi, uh, who's one of the major gangsters in Saudi Arabia, very gun-running, probably narco-trafficking, you know, very crazy. He was in the Iran-Contra thing and so on. He was talking about what the great opportunities they would now have for investment in the occupied territories uh, if things would work properly. A couple of months ago, the Wall Street Journal had actually a marvelous article about a joint venture between Adnan Khashoggi in Saudi Arabia and Yaakov Nimrodi, who I guess is about as maybe his closest equivalent in Israel, I don't know, uh, another, you know, gun runner, gangster, etc. Uh, and they were, they were setting up a joint venture, I think in Gaza or something, to try to see if they could make some money ripping off the World Bank and other people who were poor, supposedly going to be pouring development funds into there. Well, you know, there are a lot of possibilities there. Uh, the uh, long term, what the long, if you're, for the rational imperialists, uh, the idea would surely be to try to turn the occupied territories into something like the Caribbean Basin. Uh, and then the Palestinians will in fact have a role. They'll have the same role as Haitians or uh, Salvadorans or say these Chinese women who burned to death and locked into factories making toys that rich Westerners will then sell, give, buy for their children on Christmas, at least if they get the blood washed off in time, and so on. That's a kind of role that most of the third world is supposed to play, and there's every reason why the Palestinians should be able to play that kind of role too. There's only really one thing blocking it, and that's what Israel's going to be talking, one of the things we'll be talking about, and that's Israeli racism. Uh, uh, if the racism may be so high uh, and so hard to overcome, that they'll simply be unable to participate in turning the territories into a kind of Caribbean basin, a kind of Haiti or something, which would be the rational thing to do. Uh, that would mean running, getting the population to be run by local, by their own terrorists, you know, by what we call security forces, the gangsters we train and control to run their own populations and, and we move in if they're out of control. So a kind of a Palestinian Shin Beit, uh, secret police as it's sometimes even called already. Uh, and then to move, as some Israeli industrialists have said, to move uh, openly, to go from what they call colonialism to neo-colonialism. That would be the rational approach. On the other hand, it's likely, I don't know if it will happen, but it's possible that Israel will choose a different course, uh, which is to implement a, uh, the thinking of the Israeli Foreign Office back in 1948, the course of the war, uh, when they predicted, these I should say are the kind of doves, you know, if you look at the spectrum, they predicted that the Palestinians, I'm quoting, the Palestinians will die or turn into human dust and the waste of society and join the most impoverished classes in the Arab countries. Well, that isn't good for investment, but, you know, has other benefits. 
As far as the U.S. is concerned, there is, of course, a third possibility, that is that the U.S. could join the rest of the world and abandon its uh, firm rejectionist stand and its opposition to withdrawal. Uh, and uh, then other options could open up, including longer term ones, which might be rather beneficial to all the people in the region, if not to foreign investors. Well, as far as, far as these options are concerned, I think for the United States, it's a matter more or less of indifference. Uh, these are kind of details from the point of view of U.S. global planning. Sites are set much higher, uh, and the fate of a little more human dust uh, is sort of probably below the threshold. Uh, I'm speaking now of planners and investors and uh, respectable intellectuals and leading elements generally. Uh, others will uh, draw their own conclusions uh, based on human values, which are very remote from those of the reigning uh, intellectual culture. Well, human values is what uh, uh, Israel Shachak has been de defending uh, with great uh, courage and integrity for many years. Uh, he's formerly a professor at the Hebrew University, a or well-known organic chemist, uh, but he's known to us primarily not for his scientific work, but for his leading role, and uh, absolutely leading role in uh, uh, human in fighting for human rights uh, in, in that region and indeed anywhere. Over the years, I've had a lot of contact with human rights activists all over the world, and I have, I can't think of many, if any, people who I would rank with him and the kind of work he's done. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he, he will be talking, I gather, about material related to his recent book, uh, which uh, what, um, uh, which actually got a ma major review in Haaretz, the leading Israeli journal, by uh, Benny Betalachmi, another common friend, uh, and merited a, a very favorable and merit well-merited review. And I'd just like to turn it over to him, and now I can satisfy my curiosity and hear a speech, not just read a letter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Although I will indeed try to introduce uh, some material from my book, uh, I will mostly devote my presentation to questions of human rights and how they affect the Israeli policies, simply because I always consider that with all my passion for various kinds of scholarship that human rights and alleviating human suffering have to come first. Uh, the general tab, uh, uh, subject of my presentation will indeed have to do with fundamentalists, but not what a fundamentalist group, in this case Jewish, is doing by itself, but how fundamentalistic thinking and theories are affecting the practices, the theories and practices uh, of the State of Israel and the territories, of course, in Israel too, but I will omit the, uh, that from the consideration for this time. And how actually the, those, uh, this ideology, which is strictly followed by the secular state for various reasons, uh, are, is, uh, try, is making the peace process, the Oslo Cairo peace process, which is actually very profitable to Israel, and which is everything that Noam Chomsky has said it is, into by now something very unrealistic. Meaning that there are, uh, if a state is enslaved more to ideology than to profit, it cannot serve profit. You know there is that great uh, saying, you cannot serve God and mammon. Maybe uh, instead of God, we should substitute other things in this connection. But certainly, you cannot serve racist ideology, as I will immediately uh, show, and conduct realistic policies in, uh, well, uh, let us say, um, which will bring investors to the area. I will begin with problem of land, 
First of all, at it came to exist after 27 years of occupation, and as it continued after Oslo, meaning in the last 14 months. At the time that Oslo government agreements were signed, September 1993, about 70% of the West Bank and about 30% of the Gaza Strip came into possession, into ownership of the State of Israel. I will not discuss here for lack of time how they came into possession of State of, of Israel, just as I will not uh, discuss how much of the fed, most of federal land in the United States became federal land. The most important thing for me is to say that officially, not socially, but officially, land which belongs to State of Israel is uh, used only for benefit of Jews. Let me get it very, uh, very accurate. When you read in your media about Israeli settlements, this is not correct. They are not intended for all Israeli citizens, of whom 17% are Palestinians, actually. Let me add at this point that, out, that there are Israeli Palestinians who serve in the army, in fact, in increasing numbers. There are Israeli Palestinians who, let us say, reached in the army the rank of colonel. Some of them were even uh, uh, governors, or usually deputy governors, of West Bank and Gaza Strip District. But the important point is that an Israeli colonel who is not Jewish cannot benefit from 70% of the area of West Bank and from the 30% area of the Gaza Strip. Uh, but the important fact, of course, is not the Israeli colonel. This is uh, illustration. Important fact is that the first thing, in my opinion, that you should know about Palestinians uh, and their feelings in the territories and also out of the territories, because uh, the land is also denied to Palestinians in diaspora, that a Palestinian from the West Bank see 70% of the, the land, of his land, on which, which is not only confiscated from him, but on which he cannot do anything. He cannot rent it, he cannot uh, either apartment or a piece. He, ca he cannot do with it everything while the land is open to officially and legally to all the Jews. Before going to the implication of the word all the Jews in this respect, let me give you, uh, uh, let me give you some uh, additional figure or additional set of figures. You know, being natural scientist, I cannot escape from feeding people with, uh, with numbers. I said right now that 30% of the Gaza Strip, the 30% which was left under Israeli ownership, all belongs to the state of Israel. The number of the people on that 30% is 6,000. The number of the people of the remaining 70 percent is 800,000. This by itself I call apartheid. The situation in Gaza Strip before, and of course in the West Bank too, before Oslo and after Oslo is a situation of apartheid. I could add many other details that majority of Gazan water is given to the 6,000 settlers on the 30% of the area, that there is a nice pleasure lake in uh, one of those areas while water in the rest of Gaza Strip is nearly bring harms to hell. It is on the border of bringing harm to hell. But I will go to something much more significant in the West Bank. If you to take those 70% of land denied to Palestinians and ask yourself what is happening to them, then the answer will be that 16% has been given to the settlers, to the Jewish settlers. Again, I, uh, I emphasize Jewish settlers, not Israeli settlers. But 54% of the land stands empty. 
It was not distributed, it was confiscated, it stands empty. I can flatter myself that for many, very many years I I formed very many friendships among Palestinians of the West Bank and many others. And I would say, and my opinion is supported by many other Israeli Jews, not necessarily those of my opinion, that had the Israeli government, after Oslo, taken those 54 percent, more than half, empty lands of the West Bank, Empty, I mean emptied. Of course, they were not empty before. Or let us now take plainly. Half of the area of the West Bank, which was robbed of its rightful Palestinian owners, but it was not given to anyone else. And giving it back to the fa Palestinian farmers, the Oslo process could, push, could be pushed for several, for quite a number of years. With all its consequences, I am now not entering the consequences. I fully agree with uh, Noam Chomsky about the consequences, but, and I know also that Israeli government considers that the Oslo process is very much for benefit, but the ideology of not give, giving back the land, which, as I point in my book, was already redeemed, redeemed meaning being given to Jews as uh, possession of the Jewish state, giving it back to non-Jews, in this case Palestinians, and causing the land therefore to become unredeemed again, was most, more important than every political consideration, let us say, that every counting of profits. Let me say something about Palestinian side in this business. Palestinians everywhere, but especially in the West Bank, have a, are using an Arabic uh, word, sumut. Sumut means attachment. By this they are ex uh, expressing, I think very justly, in a slogan, their attachment to the land. Because if you look through the years what has happened to the Palestinians in Palestine, you see that they have been driven east. And what they desire, in my view, of course, which can be disputed or contested, but in my view, based on my very many Palestinian friends, is that the process will not only stop, but to at least to symbolic or extensive sense reversed. Meaning that after a process in which always Palestinian lands were being uh, taken over and never returned, even in if some of you know about the Israeli village Baram and Ikrit, I am mentioning to you that, those, uh, that uh, just in passing that a Maronite village in Israel called Baram, whose actually uh, people of whose uh, in part helped Israel invade Lebanon because they are Maronites, still they have its land not returned. Uh, against all precedent and all benefit. If, therefore, those empty lands, contrary to existing settlements in which, as, let's say, half realist, I admit, there would have been call, uh, what is called trouble, opposition, demonstration, and so on, there is always trouble in carrying justice when, you, when the robber already has something in his possession. But I am emphasizing to you something which would not have carried trouble except ideological trouble. And this didn't happen. The second point, meaning that the idea, apartheid ideology, as I am calling it for more than 20 years, is more important than uh, other considerations. And it is this ideology application of this dialogue, of course, much more visible to Palestinians there than to people here, quite in addition, of course, to the exceptions of American media, which more and more convinced by now, ended by convincing Palestinian people that peace process is not peace for them, not for any farmer, not for any poor man, maybe for some rich people, but for nobody else besides. Let me take another point, water. I am afraid that Israelis or in Palestine are not similar in their climate to Massachusetts. 
they are more similar to Arizona and New Mexico, meaning that water is the crucial factor in agriculture, in development of agriculture. The very first thing that Israel did in the territories in September 67 was to impose a regulation, or two regulations really, one prohibiting Palestinians to drill or dig wells on their own private property. Let me get it clear, on the 30% of West Bank, which still belongs to Palestinians, they are forbidden totally and completely to dig wells from September 67. And in the existing wells, whose capacity was measured at the time, they are prohibited to install new pumps with greater capacity. Of course, the settlers are uh, not uh, prohibited to do this, with the result that, according to my last data, which are admittedly about four years old, the 130,000 settlers on the West Bank are used more water for agriculture than one and a half million of Palestinians. First of all, I call it apartheid again. Secondly, I, um, I will tell you that if after Oslo, Israeli government would give thousand, let us say, chosen Palestinian farmers permits to dig 1,000 wells. Let us say chosen, chosen by their, let's say, by the willingness to support peace process. But 1,000 Palestinian farmers. This would have enormous, have uh, be of enormous effect, not only of those 1,000 farmers, but at, let us say on their cousins and second cousins, practically on all the farmers, because just in the case of land, and especially empty land, this would have shown that the process of not allowing development on for one side and allowing it on other would be reversed. Now, apart, uh, you can imagine there are, there are very many other discriminations, or shall I say, manifestation of apartheid in the territories. But before I would, therefore, I will limit myself and speak about one more before going d more deeply to analyzing the situation in general terms of, uh, of apartheid in, uh, and its uh, roots, in ide its ideological roots, meaning from where this ideology uh, arose, in, at least in my view. The additional uh, factor that I want to discuss is so-called rule of law. First of all, contrary to most of the states of the world, whatever they are otherwise, and contrary to the state of Israel itself, the system of law in West Bank and Gaza Strip is not territorial. What it means is it is not territorial. Uh, let, us, uh, let us take state of the so-called state of Panama. I am not now discussing how it serves the United States interest. Uh, I think I am agreed with it with uh, Noam Chomsky. But I would want to point to you a fact which is different in Panama and in the territories. Let us say an American tourist goes to Panama City and commits a traffic offense. Let us say he is driving widely or drunkenly. Of course, the Panama police will arrest him. Of course, he will be put uh, before Panama court. And I think that the United States in such cases will not protest. At least it didn't protest now. But in uh, territories, there is no territorial law, therefore, like in Tan Panama or even like Grenada. Israeli Jews, especially settlers, but all Israeli Jews, if they will commit an offense in the territories, including traffic offense, will be brought to Israel and will be judged within Israel by Israeli civilian court, courts. Not, by the way, by the, by the Israeli military courts, which are judging Palestinians for any offense. 
meaning that even though the courts in territories are Israeli and military in order to, enhance, to show the superiority of one group over another, the uh, Israeli military courts in territories have till this very day not judged a single Israeli. They judge soldiers, of course, but not single Israeli civilian. Let us go a little more. Israel had, uh, until beginning of Intifada, until, let us say, spring 88, a Palestinian force acting under its orders and composed of Palestinian policemen. In the beginning of Intifada, those policemen uh, were compelled by pressure to resign. The force, therefore, existed, let's say, more than 20 years. During all that time, it was prohibited to detain Israeli Jew and especially settler. It could, let us say, if seeing a car speeding or something, stop it, because nobody can be sure who is the driver who is in the car. It could ask for identification card. On seeing the words Israeli and then Jew, the only thing that Palestinian policemen could say was that Please uh, wait until uh, I call an uh, Israeli army or Jewish police, or if not, he could only write the number. The same thing was written into Cairo to agreement, which means that if Israeli Jew visits, as he can visit all the time, uh, Gaza, the autonomous Gaza Strip, let me say in passing that uh, Palestinians who want to go out from Gaza to Israel need both Palestinian and Israeli permission. But Israelis who enter autonomous Gaza Strip need only Israeli permission. Once they get it, Palestinians have to admit them. So let us say such an Israeli Jew is admitted and he commits a traffic offense in the Gaza Strip. By text of Cairo agreement, the same racist thing, which doesn't exist in Panama or other places, Palestinian police uh, that you hear so much about in New York Times, but of course not about this, uh, we uh, have no power to detain an Israeli Jew simply because he is an Israeli Jew. Let us go even more farther on this law enforcement. Uh, you m this has even appeared in Israel, in American media, that Israel refuses uh, to free certain categories of prisoners. However, the exact quotations, and they are, as they appear in the Hebrew media, or even in Jerusalem Post, and of course on Israeli TV and uh, radio, have by everyone from Rabin down have not been given in the United States. The official, Israel, uh, the official Israeli policy is that Israel will free prisoners who have Arab blood on their hands and will refuse to free prisoners who have Jewish blood on their hands. The Arab blood and Jewish blood are quotation from all possible Israeli sources, in uh, as I say, from Rabin down. Blood being, uh, meaning not only killing in this respect, but also wounding. Again, uh, let me first say before discussing this, that this is a reversion to the policy of Christian state against Jews in the pre-modern periods. Christian states used to employ in their proclamation a very, what they thought then correct, but what is of course very offensive term, Christian blood. If you will read the proclamations of uh, Queen Elizabeth or King Philip II or even until 18th century, they used to justify their wars and their expedition by, by including a clause in the orders that they gave to commanders that this conquest, this war should be done with the less with the lesser possible effusion of Christian blood. This, is, this was very common until 18th century. And of course, this meant for them the Jewish blood, of course, Muslim blood, 
red Indian blood, whatever blood you can, you can to whatever you can add after this, was of no concern that a war waged, as, as it is very true, between Christian powers, if you look into history book, had different characters, officially different characters, from war waged by a Christian power against a non-Christian power or non-Christian population. Some of the suffering of Jews during all those hundreds of years proceeded from that example. I am saying that we are doing to Palestinians, as my former example and this example so, more or less what Christians and to lesser degree Muslims have done to us. We are of course not the first who have done, uh, done this. It is quite common that a persecuted group becomes persecutor. We have to inquire how it happens. We have not to close up it, but certainly the expressions used by Rabin and everybody else about freeing of Palestinian uh, prisoners, the, ex the open expression about blood, Jewish blood and uh, Christian bl uh, and uh, Arab blood resemble the expressions used by anti-Semitic regimes against Jews and all the others. But let us go a little farther. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that because of this, this ruling crit criterion, what you hear that Israeli government refuses to, fee, to free prisoners of Hamas and free prisoners of Fatah is simply not true. Fatah prisoners who happen to wound Jews are not freed because they have Jewish blood on their hands. It is as simply as this. Hamas prisoners, if they signed a simple declaration and they only killed Arabs, are freed. Third, and it is much and it is more important than even those considerations, the whole matter of freeing or not freeing prisoners is in realistic terms nonsense, because after Oslo, had they all been freed at once, as Palestinians expected, they could be easily rearrested again. In realistic terms, as many realistic commentators, very far from my opinions otherwise, pointed up, the very best thing that could be done to push the Oslo process at once is to free all the prisoners, or at least 99% of them, 98% of them, and then use them while free as a bargaining power, which was, of course, never done. In, but there is uh, something in Israeli policy in cases of uh, taking life in the territories, which continues now for 20 years and more, which is, in principle, even more shocking and also exhibits, I think, the true character of Israeli regime more than the cases that I told you so far. It has been recorded very many times, I will say especially by the journalist Daniel Rubinstein, who is uh, in Israeli terms quite a moderate, who although I am friendly with him, let us say he's not of my opinion and I am not of, uh, of his opinion, but who is very factually accurate. Uh, he uh, repeated it again in article written in Haaretz of, on 3rd of October, that according to open declarations of Israeli authorities, that for more than 20 years by now, in case of what is called uh, murder not connected with security, meaning the usual murder, let's say, because neighbors are quarreling, because there are family reasons, because of any... Uh, uh, any, uh, during a robbery, during anything not connected with security of the state of Israel, when the murderers are caught, and by the way, they are easily caught because both in Palestinian and Jewish society, such murderers usually give themselves up. They are duly sentenced to life imprisonment, but in case of Arabs in the territories, they are immediately freed and sent home the reason, the reason invented, commas, being that there is no place for them in prisons, that prisons are so full 
of security offenders that there is no place there for a murderer who simply uh, murdered his neighbor. Now this me, this official policy means for me not only something which is very deeply shocking, but something that I am arguing for more than 20 years, that the Israeli rule in territories is not to be compared with the usual imperialistic rules. It is not a colonial rule. Of course, it is much worse. But the important thing is that it is different in kind. I don't think that you, at least I didn't find, if, uh, but I don't think that you will find any colony in the 20th century or any state which has, let's say, neocolonialist status in which murderers who are already caught and sentenced are then sent home as a matter of policy. Which is, I think, and let me tell you that in my opinion, after all that I told you about uh, apartheid in the territories, this to me is the most important mark of that apartheid, that even when a murderer is being Caught, it is, he is not being officially, as a matter of policy, punished. Let me now, before returning again to the subject of territories, say a few words about my views. From this point, I will tell you not so much facts. Of course, I will quote facts, but I will, it will be mostly my interpretation from where this policy arose. We have here a Jewish state carrying a policy which, if, would, if it would have been applied to Jews, of course, it would uh, justifiably bring a very great process. And how it come that, at the beginning, in the late 60s, great majority of Israel Jews have supported it. By now, there is some opposition, at least to some aspect, but still, Government which carries it has a majority, and most of the opposition to this government is from the right, which means that they want more of the same. In my opinion, you cannot understand the word Jews and Jewish if you look only on modern Jews, or if where, what is in many, uh, uh, for many points of view worse, <laughs> If you read your Bible, rather your Old Testament, and you make then what I call a quantum jump from the age of the Bible, which ended mostly in the 5th century BC, to the 20th or even the 19th century. My book is the servant to, so to say, to fill this hole, to point out that during that time, Jews existed, they had a culture, they had a religion very different from the biblical Judaism, very different from the, uh, from the religion of majority of the Jews in this country, because reform and conservative Jude, uh, movements arose only in early 19th century. They are, on, they are very recent in, Jew, in terms of 3,000 years of Jewish history. And I would like to point you some social facts of uh, this period, which I call classical Judaism in my book, as explaining the oppression and the type of oppression we are inflicting now on Palestinians, which is something very similar, as you will hear presently, to what was inflicted on us during, let's say, 2000 and several hundred years. Let me begin by something that may seem strange to you in modern period, but that until the rise of modern states, let us say France after the revolution, uh, United States, you can add also to some extent, some small extent, the, Net the Republic of the Netherlands and Great Britain from late 17th century. No Jew paid his taxes as individual. What has been done by, let's say, any kingdom, republic, uh, caliphate in Islamic countries, I am speaking about Islamic and Christian countries, equally was that the ruler has imposed on the Jews in his country a lump sum every, in taxation every year, 
And then that he went, that he conferred or rather ordered the Jewish communities, usually unified Jewish communities in his country, to pay him this lump sum. And they had the power, of course, to assess every member of their community as they saw fit. And of course, you know, there is no taxation without punishing a, a taxpayer who doesn't pay his taxes. Taxation without punishment is contradiction in terms. So they, of course, could do this. Otherwise, they would not have received the money. But on the way, or together with this, the, with this power of uh, the coercive power to punish the members if they didn't pay taxes, they also had power to punish Jewish members of their communities for all kinds of religious offenses. For example, I am born in Poland. In Poland, in, uh, during uh, 18th century, we have on this very full records, Jews who didn't, let's say, violate Sabbath by riding a horse, by smoking, by everyone that you conceived, were punished not by money fines, but they were flogged. I should say here that Jewish punishments always followed the pattern of punishments in the neighboring country. They were not biblical punishments. They were simply adopted from the neighboring, from societies in which the Jews have lived. And in some cases, because in Poland Jews had really a great autonomy, they could be executed. There is a famous case, not uh, one of many cases, but of several cases, which, in which in the year 1760, 360 something years ago, 260, excuse, 230 years ago, uh, less than 10% of the Jewish history is spent. A Jew who in the town now called Lvov and formerly Lemberg, who had the temerity of write a house and smoke his pipe, admittedly on the street on which the chief rabbi of the town lived, was sentenced to death and executed with the approval of royal government. Therefore, we had a situation for more than 2,000 years in which Judaism in its orthodox form, because I again emphasize that reform and conservative and any other tendencies didn't exist, was forced on Jews by Jewish authorities. And those Jewish authorities, no less than, let us say, authority of Panama or of uh, whatever country you care, uh, of Saudi Arabia or of many other, uh, Saudi Arabia is actually a good example because uh, it's a country which also inflicts punishments for religious offenses, uh, have performed a necessary service for, of course, the rulers and the ruling classes to whom it paid taxes. And because it performed those necessary and good services, it was given power to punish its inhabit inhabitants. Me members, this time Jewish members. What has happened with the advent of modernity? And I am using the word modernity, not democracy, because the person who actually freed uh, the Jews of most of the European continent uh, from this situation, Emperor Napoleon was, of course, far from being any democrat. But he actually, when he conquered Poland, the country in which I was born, he gave the, he took from the Jews the power to punish other Jews for religious offense. Let me add uh, in passing that he also took from Poles at the same time to the power of uh, deciding that in certain cities Jews will not be allowed to live. In a city where I was born, Warsaw had a privilege from immemorial times from Polish kings of, as is nicely put in Latin, non Judeos tolerando, non, not tolerating Jews within the city limits. And it was Napoleon who said that uh, privileges of the past are not important, of course, because of uh, in imperial interest, of course, and who allowed Jews to live in Warsaw for the first time in many centuries that they lived in Poland. 
Therefore, only from that time, let us say the end of 18th century, beginning of 19th century, Jews had the power to behave not according to rules of Jewish orthodoxy. They have also to power to say things which were not favorable, which rabbis didn't approve, because we have uh, a, also a good record of punishing people for saying forbidden things. And from that time, Jewish tradition, both of other religious denominations like Reform, and of course, and of rebellion against Orthodox Judaism continues. But liber what I call liberation from outside, meaning that we were liberated by revolutions carried by other people, didn't happen in old countries simultaneously. And even when it happened, let's say in Poland, in Poland, majority of rabbis during the time of Napoleon opposed Napoleon and his liberation, uh, foreseeing very justly that freedom will be bad for orthodoxy. Indeed, it was so. 200 years ago, all Jews were orthodox. Now, only minority are orthodox. Therefore, the, remain, the Jews, are, especially Israeli Jews, are divided, you can say them, to two camps. And I will formulate, now I will forsake history and I will go to last, let's say, 10 years or 12 years in Israel. Into those who say that Jewish tradition is more important than democracy and of course also more important than state interest as expressed by terms of profit. The Jewish tradition, continuation of Jewish tradition, is more important than state power. Of course, they will say that the unity of the nation supposedly given by, if everybody will follow tradition, will give us also those things. But the present we are torn. So it amounts to saying that Jewish, the tradition is more important not only than democracy, not only than profit, but also more important than any abstract idea. Let us say idea of equality of citizens before right, before law, which means also equality of citizens before a bad law. And the idea that religious groups should not allow to punish its members, that the punishment will only be in hands of a state, and again I add, also a bad state in modern state insists on this, uh, are strange to the Jewish tradition because of those 2,000 years and more in which the tradition serves a completely different system. Because of this, at present, more than a half, 30 years ago, more than 90% of Israeli Jews, when asked a simple question, is the treatment of Palestinians in the territories undemocratic, or will such a treatment serve the end of state of Israel as conquering power, <coughs> or even would, be, would such conditions serve our permanent occupation of the territories or not, would say all those questions are not relevant. The relevance is that in, uh, the Jewish land in land of Israel will continue to be redeemed. And when it is redeemed, it should never go back to, the, uh, to be unredeemed. Let me tell you that this in the past, and I believe in such case in the present, it has happened in many, uh, in, uh, in many states. And for showing you the close similarity between this thinking and thinking which was prevalent under apartheid, I will return to the, uh, to the example of of Palestinian colonel, not only colonel, uh, soldier, jailer. There are, you know, Palestinian villages in Israel in which 90% of males uh, have their livelihood from being soldiers, border guards, policemen, and jailers, literally. 
If you want one name, I will give you one name. I could give you more. A village of Yarka in Western Galilee is such a village. Uh, so, it, that we, in spite of this, we go and discriminate in such obvious manner such uh, people who serve us, I mean, State of Israel loyally. Is it in the benefit of the state? I will answer you by giving you para, a parallel. During most of the years of apartheid in South Africa, South African regime used black policemen. I believe all of those, all those who have interested in South Africa, both in reading about the country and both in seeing the pictures, have seen under a certain year in which there was rebellion was intensified, black policemen flogging and beating and enforcing other rules, other blacks. Nevertheless, I point to you that black policemen who beat other, who used to beat other blacks, were not allowed to live in Johannesburg. They had to be under the rules of apartheid exactly like every other black. They were not be given the same. They were not given the same privileges which, let us say, the French imperialist system gave to people who learned in Sorbonne and who were good francophones and who, in other good French ways, served the French interest. And in the same way, I point to you that there is Israel, the same thing in Israel. You can say that there is one difference between South African system and Israeli system, which is that the South African apartheid was based on color, while Israeli system is based on religion, and you can convert to Judaism. I will answer to you that in my opinion, as a Jew who in his own way very critical way, but his own way is very devoted to Jewish culture and Jewish tradition of 3,000 years. We indeed think that he is more devoted to those traditions in, their be in the better sense of the word than all the Orthodox rabbis take together, if you excuse me a little boast, that uh, this makes the matter worse. Why it makes the matter worse? Let us return to the case of Warsaw, for so many hundred years denied to, or in residence to all Jews. Let us add even the city of Paris, you may not know it, but Paris was close to the Jews until the French Revolution. Only royal agents had, could obtain permission to stay in Paris and only for limited uh, amount of time. Paris until 1789 was up from some time in uh, Middle Ages, of course, after the expulsion, uh, after uh, expulsion in the 14th century, was completely close to Jews. Even when Jews were allowed to live in other areas and in France and to move around, around it. Let us say that there was a Jew, not very faithful to his tradition, maybe more dedicated to making good profits, and he wanted to live in Paris or in Warsaw. There was a way open to him, conversion. If he went to a priest, and of course, in this case, to Catholic priest, in other cases, to a, a Protestant minister, and if he converted, at the moment of his conversion, he could live in Paris and Warsaw. In Poland, actually, through, the old, uh, through all the time of Polish Commonwealth, meaning to the year 1795, a Jewish convert automatically became a noble. So he had more privileges, of course, than even uh, a, a burger of the city, and of course more privileges than a peasant, simply because of conversion. What I am telling you, that the situation in the territories exa is exactly the same. Let us me not speak of Palestinians. Let us speak now about American citizens. Let us suppose that a palace, uh, that American citizen XY wants, travels in the West Bank and fancies that he will like to settle in a spot, let us say, 
for a sabbatical. And let us fancy at the same time that I want for a year to cease to do what I am doing, and I want to take a rest among the snows of Alaska. Alaska happens to be 99% owned by the federal government of the United States. If federal official in Alaska will tell me, you, Israel Shaha, cannot rent this piece of land after, of course, obtaining visa and everything, legal immigrant, I mean, or legal temporary resident, I mean, of course, this will be discrimination. This will be anti-Semitism. I don't have to tell you that many organizations in this country, even if it would be possible, will defend me. But if American will say the same thing about those not 70, 54% of area of West Bank which stand empty but devoted to Jews, then the official policy of the State of Israel is not to allow him unless he will convert. Unless he will do the same thing as Jews who, for whatever reason, because they were also sincere conversion, did uh, before the modern period, and then they were allowed benefit denied to Jews themselves. So here you have, in my, because of the case of conversion, because of this exception to the rule, you have, it really shows how we Jews, and I mean, first of all, Israeli Jews, because we bear on this point uh, I want, on this single point, I want a little to disagree with Noam Chomsky, that whatever the American responsibility, which I of course don't deny, the, full, the first and full responsibility of what is done in territories falls on us, Israeli Jews, because we accepted the American uh, funding in the first place, so it makes us uh, the, uh, the fully responsible agent in this case. And we are, by imbibing, by internalizing the values of our oppressors, this is my view, are now doing to others what was done to us. I am, of course, parodying the text, but uh, this is exactly my intention of doing. There is, in my opinion, only one way out of this impasse. And I have shown you that the peace process, which is based on apartheid, will never therefore succeed. Because, even, because Israel will not even push it in the ways which are opposing the ideology, which is followed by its rulers and by majority of citizens. Of course, there is a way, if the world situation will change, if you will change the policy of the United States, we will follow automatically. But I am pleased to say that in many respects, a change was initiated in Israel, maybe not regard with Palestinians, and we, on this I don't want to, you to have any delusions. 85% of Israeli Jews oppose formation of Palestinian state under any conditions. Uh, even if it will be a state, uh, if I like, of course, uh, I like sometimes to tease my opponents, so I sometimes ask them, if you, uh, would you agree to Palestinian state only in the truncated Gaza Strip and to negotiate about the rest, the answer is always no or silence, meaning sovereignty is, there, uh, is denied in all areas or in any single area. But the opinions are changed in about democracy and modernity or about democracy and tradition in other areas. You see, Palestine, one of the part of the tragedy of Palestinians is that for us Israeli Jews, they are foreign affairs. And foreign, every society is not very much interested in foreign affairs, it is interested in domestic affairs. Three months, three and a half months ago, the Israeli Knesset passed a law in which the import to Israel of non-kosher meat was totally prohibited. 
This affair has caused much more interest and much more discussion than many crucial things concerning Palestinians because it counted as a domestic affair. But this affair and many other affairs have shown that the forces of tradition are not as strong now as they were strong 30 or 40 and for sure 50 years ago. And therefore, there is a possibility, maybe not a strong one, that by establishing or not establishing strength, uh, enforcing the first uh, principles of democracy at home in the state of Israel, we can also change to some extent, uh, to some but significant extent, our foreign policies, in this case, our policies towards the Palestinians, which I try to show you are ideologically based. In this situation, I think that Americans have a part of changing their policy of their countries, of their country, two roles to play. The first role is to see what we are doing and what we are, and in other words, to obtain accurate information about uh, Israel and Israeli Jews. In this respect, one thing is very crucial. To distinguish between Israeli Jew, whatever are his opinion, and, about, and the opinion of the so-called supporters of Israel in the United States. There is a crucial indifference, which I will try to explain. Let us say that I am arguing now with supporter of Likud, or, people, or with supporter of parties who are worse than Likud. Likud is actually not the worst, as I do very often and all the time and quite openly. And I will, of course, say to him in the course of argument, your policies are leading to war, and in this war, many people, including many Israeli Jews, will be killed. He will say yes. But I am taking the risk of my policies. But if he will tell me, even when my standing was much more difficult than now, your policies are leading to war, my first answer will be yes, and I am taking the risk of my opinion. I am here with you, and if the war will come, I can be hurt, or at that time, after, uh, or until a few years ago, I could even say that I will serve in the army, that I will take the risk of my opinion. The supporters of Israel, and especially the Jewish supporters of Israel, who are here, are not taking the risk of their opinion. If there will be a war because of the policies they, uh, they advocate, they will at most weep before the TV sets. What is more, if they are really supporters, let us say, of right-wing Zionism, they should, by their own principles, settle now the so-called Judea and Samaria. The fact that they are here causes them guilt feelings, and they are compensating for their guilt feeling by very much greater fanaticism than is present among the great majority of Israeli Jews. Therefore, it is your duty, I think, of whatever are your opinions of Israel, not to be fooled by the supporters of Israel in this country, but go to the source. Even when you support Israel, ask what Israeli Jews of various opinions are thinking, and only after this form your opinion. The supporters of Israel in this country are for this very good reasons not telling the truth, even on the matter, even on the most uh, basic matters. The second thing, I think that you will help democracy, you will help the right of Palestinians, you will help also the right of justice all over the world. You see, we would not have uh, been helping, butchering the Guatemalans, as Noam Chomsky mentioned, if you were not thinking about Guatemalan blood, what I quoted to you about Arab blood. The uniting factors of, uh, uh, the factor uniting Guatemalans and uh, 
uh, Arabs is that for Jews who are following the Jewish tradition of what I call classical, classical Judaism, that they are both non-Jews. And Israeli policy in territories and Guatemala and many other countries are therefore essentially the same. If we will become, which I hope we will, a country in which democracy, or if not democracy, some pre-democratic modern principles will win, we will be in a position to change also our foreign policies. Therefore, I hope that after informing yourself about situation, meaning what there is in this aspect, what? First of all, what Palestinians are suffering. I must recall at the end that my the end that the my main purpose, the main purpose of the speech was to alert you that Palestinians are in territories are suffering and their suffering is increasing. But after this, I am also requesting you that after learning about situation, you will support also those forces within Israeli Jewish community who are in favor of democracy, who are putting democracy above tra Jewish tradition. Thank you very much. And it's British client uh, who, that's the muscle that you bring in in case things really go wrong. Uh, so that's the strategic conception. Uh, the uh, uh, people, the rights that various participants have depends on their role within this framework. So uh, the local Arab facade, the, these brutal dictatorships that run the, most of the oil states, they have rights as long as they do their job. I mean, if they ever try to get out of line, they'll be gone very quickly. It won't take long. But as long as they perform their, you know, do their job the way they're supposed to, uh, then they have rights. Uh, as for the local cops on the beat, uh, same story. They have rights as long as they continue to do their jobs. They get out of line, it's the end of their rights. Uh, the uh, United States, of course, has rights by definition, so we don't have to ask about that. Uh, the, and Britain, too, as long as you know, it's our lieutenant in the region. Well, uh, you consider Israel and Palestine, uh, the two contestants in the former Palestine, Israel and the Palestinians, Israel definitely has rights. Uh, first of all, because of its local services, and also because it performs many other services, of which that vote in the UN is just a symbolic illustration, symbolic of much more significant things, like, for example, when the Carter uh, administration, uh, the Human Rights Administration, was uh, prevented by congressional legislation from sending military aid to its favorite mass murderers in Guatemala. Uh, uh, in fact, it did send the aid anyway, as later turned out, but it couldn't send enough and participate actively enough in the mass murders that were going on there, it was possible to call on Israel to do the job for us. And that's happened all over the world. And that's a major service, quite apart from the regional ones. Incidentally, all of these will continue. They have absolutely nothing to do with the Cold War, and they will continue irrespective of the Cold War. That's propaganda. Uh, so that's uh, Israel's rights, a lot of rights, because uh, uh, they do a lot of things, and that's essentially what the huge subsidy is about. Well, what about the Palestinians? Uh, you have to ask, what service do they perform to U.S. power? Uh, and the answer is none. Uh, therefore, they have no rights. That follows just logically. Anybody who doesn't, who understands the least thing about world affairs recognizes that if you don't perform any services to the powerful, your human rights are zero. In fact, in the case of the Palestinians, it's worse. Their rights are actually negative uh, because they perform a disservice. Uh, their displacement and their problems and so on cause di disruption in the region and other people get upset, not the leadership like the Saudi Arabian elite, in which I have absolutely nothing to say except what I've learned from him and you can hear it from him. Uh, but on another topic uh, uh, that I know something about and that also has a special importance for me and I think it should for most of you, uh, and that is the U.S. role in the Middle East. The special importance is obvious. First of all, that's our responsibility, uh, and that means that we can do something about it. It's within our power to change. Uh, and secondly, the responsibility happens to be huge. I mean, it's huge in most of the world, but in this case, it's just overwhelming. Uh, the U.S. has an overwhelmingly uh, influential role in the affairs of the region. Uh, it, the, in the la last few years, the United States has, in effect, succeeded in all 
long-standing objective of pretty much extending the Monroe Doctrine uh, over the uh, Middle East. The Gulf War, in my opinion, was basically intended from the U.S. point of view to teach the world that lesson, get everybody else to back off, and to recognize, as George Bush put it elegantly in the middle of the war, uh, that what we say goes. Uh, that's the lesson of the New World Order, he said. Uh, and that lesson is particularly uh, to be applied in the Middle East region, which way back um, 50 years ago, the State Department described as uh, the, uh, 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 a stupendous source of strategic power and the greatest material prize in world history, the, great, the greatest uh, prize in the world in the field of foreign investment, and one that the U.S. was certainly going to take over, not because of the enormous, only because of the enormous wealth and profits from oil production and so on, but because holding that region as a lever for world control. Uh, and that was well understood, and it's fully explicit in the internal record. And it influences, of course, determinatively influences the, the uh, policy record. Uh, just in passing, I should say that in the older areas of the uh, Monroe Doctrine, the question of other people getting in our way isn't an issue. Uh, so take, say, Cuba. Uh, the United States is now in the, what they hope, what planners hope is the final stage of uh, uh, crushing Cuba, of getting them to uh, say uncle, to borrow the words of George Shultz when he was referring to the Palestinians, talking to his boss a few years ago. Uh, he complained that the Palestinians were saying unk, 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 and oh, 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 but they never really came right out and said, uh, said uncle. And uh, for a real first-rate thug, you've got to make sure that your victims uh, you know, own up properly and do what you tell them. You know, they've got to grovel properly or else they're, you know, that the, the world doesn't learn the lessons about what we say goes. Uh, Cuba's got to learn those lessons too and they have to suffer particularly because they've been standing up and trying to follow a course of independence for 30 years. Uh, just a few weeks ago there was a vote in the United Nations, uh, uh, 101 to 2, uh, condemning the latest phases of the U.S. Uh, embargo in Cuba, specifically designed by the Clinton administration to block food and medicines, about 90 percent of what's blocked is indeed food and medicines, to make sure that plenty of children starve to death and so on. Uh, the, the vote, was, as I said, was 101 to 2. Uh, the two were the United States and Israel. Uh, that's changed from the year before when the United States also managed to pick up Romania. Uh, now only Israel's left. Uh, and that has to do with the Middle East, in fact. One of the minor services that Israel is supposed to provide, this is only one of the minor ones, uh, is to uh, um, sort of make sure that they vote with the boss when uh, it's necessary and to uh, support any outrage that uh, the boss commits. Uh, and for that, they get a huge subsidy. I mean, it's no comparison in world affairs. Uh, and that maintains a, a wealthy but largely artificial society, very rich but on a foreign dole, uh, which you and I pay for. Uh, and that dole is in fact, as well, Human Rights Watch, the leading international human rights monitor a couple, of mo uh, a couple of months ago published a book, another book, in which they pointed out once again that U.S. aid to Israel is flatly illegal. It's in flat violation of U.S. law. Uh, because U.S. law quite explicitly forbids any aid, military or other aid, to countries which systematically torture and abuse their citizens. Uh, and this book of Human Rights Watch was just yet another extensive documentation of the fact that that's exactly what we pay for. Uh, however, we should point out that this is no big problem by the standards of international lawlessness in which the U.S. is certainly a major player and, in fact, well in the lead, I think. Uh, this is uh, pretty small potatoes. Uh, well, a few remarks about the U.S. and the Middle East. Uh, I won't talk about what's actually going on now. I think if you think about the background, it all sort of follows. It, you can almost deduce what's happening. Uh, the United States has a general strategic conception as to how to run the uh, strategically most important area in the world and the greatest material prize in world history. It's one that the U.S. pretty much picked up from the British, who used to run the place before we kicked them out. Uh, the, uh, uh, the idea is that... Uh, the MIT Alternative News Collective sponsors this and other progressive events on MIT's campus and produces The Thistle, a newspaper wherein the progressive and creative minds of MIT and the surrounding community can share their work. 
Born in the midst of the campus protest against apartheid in South Africa in 1987, the thistle has co consistently explored unjustified decision making in many aspects of MIT affairs over the past seven years. As a collective, members are able to participate al and alternately coordinate every aspect of newspaper production. We hope and have many reasons to believe that the actions and presence of the thistle on the campus has helped improve the experience of students, staff, and faculty of the institute, and hopefully has inspired people to continue to support progressive causes. However, to continue these contributions, the collective needs your support. The donation that was asked at the door is not only going to help provide events like tonight's talk, but will also help purchase supplies to produce the paper. More importantly, we encourage all interested people to join with us by attending a collective meeting. We meet every Wednesday evening in the MIT Student Center. If you're interested, please sign up on the sheet that was at the front door and will be passed around during the talk. We hope to see you at next week's meeting. Tonight, the MIT Alternative News Collective is proud to present Professors Israel Shahak and Noam Chomsky, two of the world's foremost analysts of Middle Eastern issues. There will be time at the end of the speeches for members of the audience to ask questions and make very brief statements. Therefore, we ask that everyone please respect each other's desire to hear the speeches in their entirety. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Noam Chomsky, who will introduce Professor Shahak. Well, my instructions about 15 minutes ago were to say a few things about Middle East and then to uh, uh, make a few words of introduction to uh, Israel Shachak, an old, an old friend. I realized on the way over that uh, my files are full of fascinating uh, and highly informative correspondence with him over many years, I guess about 25 years now. Uh, but I've never heard him give a talk, I don't think. And I'd like to remedy that tonight uh, and would prefer to listen rather than to give a talk myself and urge you to as well. But uh, since I'm obedient and follow instructions, uh, I will uh, spend a few moments uh, commenting. Uh, however, not about the announced title. On, uh, there should be several layers of control. First of all, there have to, the, what, the big thing is oil, of course. Uh, so there has to be what the British in the old days called an Arab facade, uh, meaning local managers who do our work for them and who we pretend are independent because that's a way to sort of keep down, you know, nationalist feelings and so on and so forth. But they're just an Arab facade. Uh, and as the British put it in secret records now declassified, because back in the First World War, uh, the British will continue to run the place uh, behind various uh, uh, sort of uh, constitutional fictions, they said, like buffer state and other things. But that's the Arab facade. They have to be weak uh, because we have to make sure that they'll do exactly what we say or else we toss them out. So there has to be a, an array of local managers. That's essentially what the Gulf dictatorships are. They are local managers who jo whose job is to make sure that the huge profits from oil flow to the West, not to the people of the region. That's crucially the case. Uh, British understood it, it's even more important in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, now the people of the region happen to be backwards and unenlightened, you've all know, known about that, and they somehow don't understand why the wealth of their region has to flow to Westerners, not to them. And since they can't seem to get this through their heads, uh, no matter how much we try to explain it to them, uh, they have to, the Arab facade has to be protected against the local, from the local population. And for that, you need what the Nixon administration called local cops on the beat, uh, uh, local military forces who will kick them in the face if they get the wrong idea and if, they're, if the local security forces can't handle it. So the second layer of control has been uh, an array of gendarmes, uh, Turkey, uh, Iran under the Shah, uh, Pakistan's played that role uh, uh, for a time, uh, and Israel's right in the center of it. You know, especially since 1960s, Israel's been one of the core uh, elements of the uh, gendarmerie. Incidentally, that was recognized by the Joint Chiefs of Staff as far back as 1948. US, they were very impressed by Israel's military victories in that war and concluded, again in secret documents now declassified, that uh, 
Israel's could serve, they said the second, it was second only to Turkey, they felt at the time, as a military base which could be used to project military power, particularly important now that the British were withdrawing from the region and the U.S. was moving in and needed its own local cops on the beat. Well, that's Israel's role. Uh, now, the, uh, then in the background, of course, is the United States.